Um, Edward. <laughs> I, I, last service, I said, you know, there was a time when I would have felt the obligation to explain the gender change in the psalm, and there really comes a point where I have to really let go of that, you know, and, and to accept that the world is changing and that people actually are mature enough to understand that divinity is past gender. You know, but I still, I still, wore, I'm so codependent. <laughs> I want to make sure you're okay. Are you okay? <laughs> Actually, this now famous version of that psalm, it just goes straight to my heart. You know, so it's beyond okay. It's liberating. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you, choir. And don't they look handsome? Yeah. And appropriately, um, this month, the theme for the whole month has been um, activating transformation in our life. I guess that's what I'm just talking about, transformation of all of our ideas. And a whole month of talking about transformation, oh my, my, my. Well, it's appropriate for the month in which Easter happens, because that's what Easter is about, really. That ancient story, um, centuries old, the story. Uh, and, and for some faith traditions, it's, it's, the, it's the metaphor of transformation. That's what Easter is about. And for other faith traditions, it's the actual story of the resurrection uh, of Jesus. And we don't really mind where you are with the story or how you take it because we're from all different kinds of backgrounds here. But a lot of us are from Christian backgrounds. And so it, it stands to reason that we show up here with a lot of our history. And so Easter becomes a very important observation. And I, I've noticed that it's one of the three times in the year when church is extraordinarily full. <laughs> you know, the other two being um, Christmas and Thanksgiving. You know, we come from out of town to be with our families, and then children come to church with their parents to make everybody happy. And <laughs> so here you are with me on Easter, and I tell you, it makes for a real interesting challenge for pastors and preach preachers and priests, because, you know, what else is there to say? You've told the story so many times. What else is there, you know? And I noticed that when I hear a story over and over again, I quit listening. Have you got a friend who tells the same story or a parent? <laughs> you know, you just don't hear it anymore, you know, or think you know it all, or you, you assume that you know the whole thing. So as I was preparing the notes for this, I, I asked myself, what is it about the Easter story? Or what is it about the story of transformation in, in general that I think I know already? <laughs> or what's the part that I've stopped listening to? Or even better, what's the part I really don't want to hear? <laughs> oh, and there's a lot. <laughs> there's so much I just don't want to hear. And I started to confess last week when we talked about Palm Sunday and the events that led up to Easter. And I talked about how, you know, there's this period in between the death and the resurrection, the three days in the tomb that some of us have um, reluctance to go through, that, you know, that dark night of the soul experience. And, and I, I confessed how I resist that part of the story, uh, be, you know, between no more and not yet. There's that part in between, and I resist it by pretending it's not happening or by call, scolding myself because it is happening or by trying to rush right through it to get to the other side so I can continue to pretend that it didn't happen at all. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. So that's one part of the story I don't want to hear. You know, I don't want to hear there's this place in between. I don't want to hear about you no know, dark night of the soul. You know, or as it shows up in the Easter story, that part of the story where the the most important thing, the most precious thing, has to die. I don't want to hear that. I'm more inclined to the story that's going to tell me, you know, the resurrection happened. It's all going to work out. It's going to be wonderful again. Yay! <laughs> you know? I don't want to suffer. I don't enjoy suffering and trial and conflict, you know. So I like stories that tell me there is life after the crash. You know, and that um, metaphors that remind me life prevails. and The spring comes back. Look at the evidence. It's all going to be fabulous. There's an afterwards, a glorious afterwards uh, that you have some say in, that you have some control over. Yeah. 
of course. <laughs> you know? So like so many good metaphysical students, you know, because I have this world view then, you know, I see there are parts of the Easter story I just don't want to deal with. I don't want to look at it. Like the part that leads up to the betrayal and the murder. I, I don't like that part of the story either because it, it doesn't match my idea of how the world should work. Have, have you ever argued with how things are because they don't match your idea of how they should be? <laughs> and this has a whole lot to do with Easter. It is the Easter story. And, and if you don't know the Easter story because you're not from a Christian background, I'll just give you enough detail so you can be up to speed. The central character who's going to be betrayed, crucified, and so on, apparently he knows all along exactly what is happening and what is going to happen. And he has this sense that everything is going to come crushing down on him and that he has absolutely no power whatsoever to do anything about it. And even though he has this awareness that there is a great and glorious afterwards, he still doesn't want to go through the pain and the betrayal and the suffering of the dark night of the soul. Don't blame him. And I don't like that part of the story. Because I don't like it when my spiritual role models can't cope. <laughs> when if they can't cope, it's a reminder it could happen to me. I mean, if they're not coping, I'm not coping, you know. I don't like that part of the story. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's the part that takes place in that garden that begins with a G. I can't remember. How do you say it? Thank you. That, it happens in the garden somewhere after dinner. He's with some of his students, and it says in, in Luke... Um, Beautifully, it says, and he went a little beyond them. He went on ahead of them, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, and he said, Father, if it is at all possible, take this cup away from me. You know, then the metaphysician, excuse me, what did you say? You don't want to do it? Well, why don't you just do a five-step spiritual mind treatment and change everything so it's more like how you want it? Because you can't. Or maybe you shouldn't. See, if you've ever been in a relationship that should end, then you know what's going on right here in this part of the story. You know. Especially if you've been in a relationship, it, it should end, but you want to stay in it. But you can't because it's destroying you. See, now you know what's going on already. It's got to end, even though you don't want it to, and you know all of this. And you rather it wasn't so. But it is. And he just finished Passover dinner with his, his students, his disciples, and he took two of them, I think um, Peter and James, into the garden, and he said to them, you know, won't you just stay up with me while I pray, because you know, I've got this going on for me, you know. And he began, as it says in the gospel, it says that he began to become deeply distressed and troubled. And he said, according to the Bible, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And that's when he fell to the ground on his face and said, oh my God, I know everything is possible, and if it is possible, I would prefer not to have to go through with this. And, and yet I, I know it's not my own personal will that will prevail, but yours. Now that's the part of the story that metaphysicians don't like at all. Or they stop listening. Or they skim past it.